Thank you, my lords. Uh, myself in this position, with this bill having to be brought forward, part five of the bill, because of the contents of the Northern Ireland Protocol, it finds itself in a very unfortunate position. Some of the part clauses in Part 5 are ones that Unionists in Northern Ireland do not find much comfort in, particularly the clauses about preventing reachback in relation to the application of state aid rules for Great Britain, but nevertheless allowing Northern Ireland to be subject to EU state aid rules, which could cause considerable problems going forward. Northern Ireland in terms of its competitive position, businesses in Northern Ireland with businesses in the rest of the United Kingdom. And the protocol is at the root of the problem. The noble Lord, Lord MP, referred to this. The protocol was opposed by us on these benches because it did make such a differentiation between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom as we left the European Union, and we were always promised that we would leave as one United Kingdom. But I have to correct the noble lord in one thing. He has today and on previous occasions sought to lay some responsibility at the feet of the DUP for this sad situation. Of course he will know that on the 2nd of October, and it's worth correcting the record since the assertion has been made, that on the 2nd of, of October last year when the Prime Minister sent his proposals to Jean-Claude Juncker, one of the five principles, the elements that the Prime Minister set out was that any potential all-island regulatory zone on the island of Ireland could only happen if the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly should have the opportunity to endorse those arrangements before they enter into force and every four years afterwards. If consent is not secured, the arrangements will lapse. And it was on that basis, with the security of a lock in the Northern Ireland Assembly, as was agreed, of course, in the joint report of December 2017, made between the EU and the United Kingdom. It was on that basis that we gave a cautious welcome. But when the Prime Minister jettisoned that democratic consent principle, and the government indeed has jettisoned that principle of giving the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Executive the right to say that this should come into force in Northern Ireland. It, we made it clear that we could, would not support the government in that. So I think it's important to correct the record and lay the responsibility where it truly lies. My Lords, the clauses 43 and 44, and indeed we've heard many eloquent speeches tonight, but I speak as one who has represented the city of Belfast for over 35 years, represented a very diverse constituency, and whether a business is owned or run by someone from the Unionist family or somebody from the Nationalist family, or indeed from no particular political persuasion at all, they're all interested in trying to make their companies work and be prosperous and employ people and contribute to the economy. And they're all united on the fact that it would be disastrous to have checks between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom to fetter trade unnecessarily, because that adds to costs. When you consider that over £8 billion pounds worth of trade is done NI, Northern Ireland to Great Britain, Great Britain to Northern Ireland every year. These are immense, this is an immense amount of trade. Almost 60% of all trade in Northern Ireland is done with the rest of the United Kingdom. So when we talk about grand philosophical and legal principles, and I understand all of that, although this is not a unique situation for any country to find itself in, to hear some noble lords, one would think that this was the only country that had ever decided to step away from an international obligation in the interest of its own sovereignty and its own interests of its own citizens. That's not the case by far. None of that has been referenced, and I don't have time tonight to go into all of that. It's more appropriate, perhaps, to a second reading speech than in these clauses. But I think it is important to remember the reality of the economic position that many companies and people in Northern Ireland who are employed by those companies will find themselves in if sensible arrangements are not made 
to recognise that Northern Ireland is a full member of the Customs Union of the United Kingdom. And remember, the government and the EU made commitments in this regard. I referred earlier to the joint report that was agreed between the United Kingdom government and the EU back in December 2017 that allowed the negotiations to move on to their next stage at that point. What did paragraph 50 and the EU agreed to this, remember? In the absence of agreed solutions, the United Kingdom will ensure that no new regulatory barriers develop between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom unless, and this is the point I made earlier, consistent with the 1998 agreement, so we won't uphold the agreement, let's, let's listen carefully. The Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly agree that distinct arrangements are appropriate for Northern Ireland in all circumstances. And, noble lords, it's important to remember this. In all circumstances, this agreement between the EU and the UK states, the United Kingdom will continue to ensure the same unfettered access for Northern Ireland's businesses to the whole of the United Kingdom internal market. So when we want to hold people to their commitments and to agreements, I think it's very, very important that we look at all of it in the round, that we look at the commitments that were given to all of the people of Northern Ireland. And we have had recently, we have talked about the stability of devolution. Recently we have gone through a very difficult period where for three years we didn't have the executive up and running in Northern Ireland, but we got it back up and running in January of this year. And the new decade, new approach agreement, which meant that that executive and assembly could get up and running again, and thank goodness it did, given the current situation we find ourselves in, grappling with unprecedented challenges. What does that NDNA say? It was a basis on which the parties restored devolution. In, on page 47, the paragraph 10, it states the government welcomes the consensus reached by all the parties in relation to protections they want to see for trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain under the protocol. The government is absolutely committed to ensuring that Northern Ireland remains an integral part of the UK internal market, in line with the clear guarantee in the protocol that Northern Ireland remains in the customs territory of the United Kingdom. To address the issues raised by the parties, plural, not just the unionist parties, we will legislate, we will legislate to guarantee unfettered access right. for Northern Ireland's businesses to the whole of the UK internal market and ensure that this legislation is in force for the 1st of January 2021. That was signed in January of this year after the Northern Ireland Protocol was agreed, indeed after the general election. My noble Lords, I think it is important, therefore, to look at this. It's very easy to look at the Belfast Agreement and say it's all about maintaining no border on the island of Ireland. I agree with no border for customs and trade. My father was a customs officer for many years on the border. I know what it's like personally. After serving in the army, that's what, that's what he did. You know, I, 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 know, I, know, I, I remember as a child going out to those customs posts and watching what happened. The United Kingdom government has never suggested, nor has any party in the Northern Ireland Assembly, any kind of infrastructure or border controls north-south. But equally, we have been at pains to say that just as it's unacceptable to nationals to have that border on the island of Ireland, it is equally unacceptable to create barriers between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Correct. That is why we feel strongly that some of the emphasis on the Belfast Agreement that has been made in this house, this, this noble house and other places, has, I think, erred somewhat to emphasise one side of the situation. Many, many unionists feel deeply, deeply frustrated and angry tonight in Northern Ireland about the way in which it's OK to have a free border north-south, but you can do whatever you like east-west. We must come to sensible, pragmatic arrangements 
the Belfast Agreement and the St Andrews Agreement, which was negotiated by our party in Sinn Féin. These are important agreements to Northern Ireland, which must be implemented in a balanced way. And I think that I would just make an appeal as I close to Noble Lords that we take into account previous commitments, pledges and promises, agreements made by the EU itself and Her Majesty's Government before and after the Northern Ireland Protocol was introduced. And let us please have balance in this in regard to the need to ensure that unionists as well as nationalists and those of no political affiliation are comfortable, all of us, with the arrangements that come into force after the transition period ends.